Welcome, everyone. Thank you for waiting a moment as we got situated. We had a couple of uh, sessions starting. Appreciate your patience, and we're so happy to have you here. Uh, I'm Ruth Ellis from the Center for Collaborative Education um, as part of the uh, Teach for LA team, and I'm going to turn it over to Liz Buffington, our workshop presenter. Hi, everyone. How are you this morning? I'd love a good morning in the chat, if possible. Good afternoon. It's great to see everybody. Can I also get a check just in this synchronous space that you can hear me? I see some friends already joining. That's great. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful. All right. Well, um, first off, I'm going to introduce myself and... Uh, use that as an opportunity to share my screen and get settled. Um, could you all tell me a little bit about yourself and where you are joining from? Good morning, good morning. Where are you all joining from, if you don't mind typing in the chat? Kerman, wonderful. Welcome, Ashley. I see some people are still getting connected to um, the sound. Cheryl Johnson, wonderful. Welcome from, and I believe it's Lovis Community College, we're glad that you're here. And I see we have Leticia and Tiffany, um, Natasia, Vanessa is still joining, Luke is still joining, Tracy. Well, I'm glad that you're all here. Thank you for being here. Oh, wonderful. Tiffany, I'm so glad that you're joining us from Pasadena City College. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to keep admitting some people who are coming and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Liz Buffington. I am a lecturer and the credential coordinator at the School of Teacher Education at San Diego State University. And I am so excited to connect with you all and share about the interactive agenda. And I used the interactive agenda um, really starting during COVID, during emergency response to education. And it has become an instructional foundation that I use in all of my classes. And so I'm excited to share with you just a little bit about how it might um, be something that you think about using part of or, or some of or all um, to encourage engagement and ownership of learning in your classrooms. Good morning, Luke. We're glad you're here. So uh, the interactive agenda is a way to encourage student engagement and ownership of learning in a synchronous classroom setting. I do have a lot of student teachers who have started using the interactive agenda in their face-to-face -face classroom as well. And so hopefully you'll see that this is a transformational instructional strategy that you could use in a face-to-face -face or synchronous setting. Um, we're going to talk about this um, instructional strategy through the lens of constructivism, meaning that we're constantly making meaning, um, learning meeting, and constructing our shared learning experience um, together. Students, teachers, students to students, teachers to students, etc. cetera. Um, and we're doing this to support that student agency. In my perspective, it's for college level coursework, but we always want to be working with our students in appropriate content level coursework for their grade level. Um, and part of this will have elements of student roles, formative assessment through feedback, and then different full participation discussion technique. And if at any time you have a question, I invite you to post those in the chat. Um, I like to be very um, focused on engagement techniques. And so that is one strategy that you'll see. I try to utilize the chat on a regular basis. 
So let's start and first think about what a transformational experience is. It's a really broad question. And so perhaps you could all post in the chat how you engage your learners in transformational learning. And I'll just pause and let you all present that. And you can post in the chat whenever you are ready. All right, I had a private chat come through that they like to encourage students to collaborate with each other. That is an excellent strategy. I'm waiting for a few others to maybe post in the chat. While we're doing that, um, thank you for those private that private chat. Yeah, you're building on that great comment of encouraging thoughtfulness and reflective mindsets. You always want to have a way for students to engage in the content um, and ask questions and track their thinking. And in order to do that, you need to think about some different ways that you can have that full ownership of learning, really building on that learning agent, learner agency, and then thinking about how you can bring students in or learners in to uh, the shared facilitation of the learning environment as active learners in the moment. Um, and that's also a great place to have formative assessment. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you a little bit about what the agenda, my interactive agenda might look like. You can see it here on the screen. I'm actually gonna zoom in for you. Um, the way I use it is it is a Google Doc and it is open to all to edit. So there's some logistical information. We're gonna talk about roles, links, objectives, the topic deadline and time, and then the note taking strategies. So as I scroll in on this a little bit, you'll notice that I have an agenda here from a class that I actually taught last week. And you'll notice that I have some roles. So when we go to roles first, you'll see that we had um, a timekeeper and a chat monitor and note takers. So the timekeeper is, um, it's really helpful to have a student uh, participate in keeping the class on time. Um, and it helps um, encourage full participation. This is oftentimes a volunteer uh, role and it is a rotating role. And so the intent is that everyone takes turns. The chat monitor acts as someone who is taking time to um, help with the chat and ask other students um, questions and also support anyone who's facilitating, either the instructor or the, um, the other students and pausing them if there's reminders in the chat. The note takers is an evolved role. What you will notice on the bottom here is that this is a regular space in the interactive agenda. You've got a space for the topic with the time and then always a notes column underneath. And students take collaborative notes using the interactive agenda. In the beginning, I had one note taker. Um, and oftentimes this would go to the student or the learner who felt most connected to the topic. They were very comfortable typing, um, usually a native English speaker. And I was recently challenged by a colleague to think about the note-taking role in an equitable lens. And so um, my learners have decided to have multiple note-takers. And the reason for this is we wanna make sure that the synthesis of learning is not coming through just one perspective, that it is a collective experience and that we are also uh, sharing space for meaning-making and um, sharing of knowledge um, that doesn't come with positionality of a, a particular kind of student. And I just wanna pause and see if there are any questions that you might wanna post in the chat about our roles.
And while I'm waiting to see if there are any questions, the beautiful part about having an interactive agenda through a constructivist perspective is that as the learners shift in their um, experience, they feel comfortable sharing different suggestions of how we could utilize the interactive agenda to facilitate class learning. You'll notice too, we have links here. Oh, the age group of learners. Thank you, Tracy, great question. Um, this is for college students, but I've also used an interactive agenda um, regularly with um, students. I've seen it used with students as young as um, second and third grade when they're really focusing on their writing skills. Um, if they can type, they can do it, but you would need to scaffold appropriately. So it's really for all age groups. You would just scaffold it a little differently. I hope I answered your question. The links that are here um, are some regular, you're welcome, some regular links um, that show up. We always have a Zoom link on the interactive agenda so that students can just come right in and join the class. Um, we have a link to the Canvas course so that students can go right into the Canvas course if they need access to it. And then once the recording posts, we post that on every interactive agenda. In the Canvas course is a list of every agenda for the entire semester, because what happens is students will come back to these agendas to gather notes, to gather resources, um, and also um, the demonstrations of process learning that they may have gone through on that class session. The other element of the interactive agenda that's important to highlight is the objective. Um, I always link my objectives to um, one of our learning outcomes. And I explicitly speak to that since this is the teacher preparation course to remind and model those best practices of focusing on objective-based learning. When you look at the topic and details and time, you'll notice that the learning task that everyone is going to engage in in some way, either as a whole group or in small group settings is listed on the left-hand side. In the middle are the details. Um, this can be um, where students also submit their processed learning if they had to do some sort of a deliverable during class. Uh, for this class, we're using a rubric to provide feedback during simulations, and we have a list that we'll talk a little bit about um, how we use that um, later on. And then we have the duration of the learning time. Again, that's to help the um, timekeeper. The notes section is where students are again adding those interactive notes, and it really becomes their own. So I'm gonna move in again, just to think about what this interactive agenda allows you to do. It really allows you as the facilitator and the learner to share responsibility in a learning community. Um, you know, I see now that I'm the only one that has my camera on, which I totally understand. Um, and the interactive agenda is one way that I can see who is engaging with me in the learning without them needing to have their cameras on. Um, same thing, I can have a student who might not be verbal, a verbal communicator, that might not be their strong suit, they're still interacting in the learning and I can tell that they're engaged. It also allows for um, different ways to collaborate. When we collaborate in the chat, it's almost always with our name and sometimes students don't like that. An interactive agenda allows links to post and whatnot. Um, and students would have to do a little digging to see who posted uh, comments, et cetera. So it does allow for collaboration with um, protecting of identity, um, which oftentimes helps students sometimes feel a little more brave in sharing their perspectives. The interactive agenda also helps to promote engagement in breakout rooms by giving some specific rules um, and deliverables and a place to land. Um, nobody likes going into a breakout room and having learners say, wait, what are we doing? Um, and so this allows them to have a document that they take with them into the breakout room. And then because everyone can add to the interactive agenda, 
every single person in the class has access to learning products in the moment. So if you were doing some sort of collaborative research, everyone would have access to everyone's research, which is ultimate collaboration. So I'm just gonna pause and see if there's some more questions. Um, and yes, Cheryl, I do find that the interactive agenda is the best in a Google Doc setting. Um, there are, what I would do is I would just simply post a link within Canvas. You could also use Microsoft if you were a Microsoft school um, because there are link, you can get a live Microsoft document. I like to think of Canvas as the learning management system, and then you utilize different tools and whatnot within that learning management system. I hope that supported your question. Okay. So again, let's think a little bit about that constructivist foundation as educators and, and educators of educators. When we think about what John Dewey says about giving people something to do, not just something to learn and passively listen to, um, the doing is really what helps us determine that thinking and the learning, which naturally leads to results. And so as you build on Dewey's thinking, let's think a little bit about the different modes of representation. And this is where we think about inactive representation or um, inactive representation that can be um, action based, the ionic representation, um, which is image based, and the symbolic representation, which is language based. So, this is how knowledge is stored and encoded in our memory. And so, we have to do something, right, for that action based learning to happen the interactive agenda helps us um, interact with that in our brains. We're adding links, we're adding notes, we're clicking on the same document. It also allows for image-based learning where there are images gauged that uh, the agenda looks the same. So it's got that space of routine built in, which helps all learners, they know where to go and you can focus on that so that you can really have some engagement. Um, and then language-based. Um, this is hugely important. Uh, the interactive agenda does not have to be in the primary language of the facilitator. You can have language meaning making happening between multiple languages in the interactive agenda. And so it is also another way where you can have an asset-based community of learning happening. I want to pause and see if anyone wants to share anything. Um, this was really helpful for me when I first started using it. What I found was my slide decks during COVID were boring. My students weren't engaged. Cameras kept turning off and staying off. And I really needed something to help us connect as a learning community. Um, what I learned during emergency response to instruction is that digital tools can help bridge experiences in the learning environment, which is why when I facilitate in person as well, I also use an interactive agenda. Yes, right, yeah, and we all learn differently. Okay. So um, I'd like to take a minute and I'm gonna ask you all to post, what are some of your favorite face learning strategies that you use with your learners? And I'm gonna ask if everyone could post. Here's some examples here, but you might have some that you like and some that you um, that are not listed. And so I look forward to reading what your favorites are. <gasps> you had me at Socratic Seminar, Cheryl. Love it. Hey, Ashley. Well, hopefully we're helping you find some different tools you can use. Oh, great. 
And please feel free to unmute as well if you're in a space where you can do so or continue to use the chat. Cheryl, do you like to do, have you ever done Socratic seminar in a digital space or had that opportunity? Okay, well, um, great news. Um, we have um, some different examples here that you can use. Um, and you can use these in a digital space and in a face-to-face -face space. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about some of these examples. So you can use role-playing uh, breakout rooms, whole class discussions to encourage that um, student simulation, practice interviews, business team meetings, et cetera. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about roles that you would assign to students if you were going to do role playing. And we're also going to talk about how I've used a rubric to prepare for these events and also how I use the rubric to debrief and have full participation. You can also do some fishbowl discussions. This is similar to Cheryl's Socratic seminar. I love a Socratic seminar. Um, and you sometimes people choose to do the fishbowl where everyone is in one big circle and people pop in and out. You could certainly use the interactive agenda and insert a circle and have people move their cursors um, and it'll show up on the agenda and then they're able to say that they want to be in the center to share. Um, or you could do um, some pilot co-pilots where they're sending some um, information in the chat. The nice thing is, is that when you do a fishbowl discussion, once you get comfortable doing it in an online setting and using the digital interactive agenda to, uh, place um, someone's name or text box in a spot on the agenda that signifies they're going to be doing the speaking or responding, you're going to get that full engagement from the student, meaning that you're going to have to practice it a little bit. It usually takes about three times to four times before my students are really ready to go with the roles for interactive agenda. Um, and they, um, and so they um, are able to uh, constantly connect with each other. They don't have to wait for me to say, hey, I need you all to do X, Y, and Z. It really, um, it really helps students to take ownership of the learning. And oftentimes they just need to be reminded and um, invited often and encouraged positively that how they're engaging in a synchronous space is just as valuable as if they were in a face-to-face -face space and that you welcome their connection and collaboration. Um, sometimes that computer screen can bring up a little, um, a, a little intimidation. You can also do some text data analysis uh, through the jigsaw model where you would do the front loading of the work instructionally by breaking up a reading um, or some sort of chart and having um, a group of students work together and then send them off to be experts for a particular part and then come back to share their findings either in another small group or a whole group. Um, and they can use that whiteboard or share screen option in order to do that. Uh, the interactive agenda becomes a great space to do these jigsaws because you can identify roles, room numbers, you can have them add their names next to a room number. And so they're control are uh, really controlling their own logistic and their own participation. And with that tends to just come full participation because as a facilitator, you're saying, okay, I'm waiting for everyone to add their name right to the appropriate group that they've been assigned. And then you open up breakout rooms. So it becomes a great way to manage the logistics. And again, it's also wonderful for a, a place for students to share their desktops and give that presentation. Um, and they can pop a link to anything that they wanna share with the student into the interactive agenda. 
So again, these are just some examples um, and it's a wonderful way to um, encourage that connection and community building around a learning content. And Simone, no problem. We are glad you are here. Thank you for being here. And I think Leticia might have had to leave, but I did upload um, the presentations to um, the uh, files. So I think they're going to share them out, but go ahead and email me and I'll make sure you get it. So the next thing is, is that we want to talk a little bit about what it means. Oh, hi, Leticia. I um I had to ask permission to my professor and then he left me. So I have to go back and sign in again. So yeah, I missed the part, but I will make sure to get it, email you. Thank you. Okay, Luke, we can write a paper. I would love to write a paper. Here is the link if you need to go, Leticia. I love it. Y'all are great. Already using the chat. Thank you so much. Luke's got to leave. I was going to assign him to be the um, chat monitor. <laughs> All right. Um, so the whole group, again, we talked a little bit about some of the roles, chat monitor, timekeeper, note keeper. Um, and that's a great place to start. As you scaffold the experience for learners, no matter the age group, here are some of the roles that I have found to be really helpful. When I put people into breakout groups, I will ask them by groups and I'll oftentimes put a table um, with the group number um, and the roles assigned and ask the student to write their name next to it. Um, obviously it's helpful to always have a timekeeper and a spokesperson or a narrator. Um, the illustrator would almost be like the note catcher or the person who might create any visual representation of the learning for the group. And the most important um, addition to the breakout groups that I have done is the equity of voice protector or the person who is there to manage equity of voice. Why might you think I have this role in the breakout groups? And why, why might I want to include that on the interactive agenda? All right, so I got about the, to explain the students more about the topic of the people that is attending the meeting. That is one way. Yep, they can explain the topic. But have you ever been in a group where one person takes all the voice and doesn't share the space? Yes, I have been. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's that people are processing and they need that quiet processing time. That's fine. Um, but sometimes you'll have someone in a group who they may mean well, but they're hogging all of the airspace. And so the equity of voice person is there to manage and make sure that everyone is participating in some fashion. Now that can mean that they're participating in the chat if that's been an agreement. Sometimes with the adult learners, we need to allow for that. With younger learners, you might put an aide in the, in the breakout room to support equity of voice until you can get to the point where the students are doing the equity of voice um, management. I like to think of um, the Wong book, The First Days of School, and how they were saying, oh my gosh, the students were able to take care of all the rituals and routines. I'm dating myself. I know that book is, is dated. But the interactive agenda is one way that you can go in and really help students take active roles in their learning so that they're able to manage themselves and each other and you're able to be there to engage in content conversation and formative assessment. Again, anybody can take these roles. Um, you could have an adult do it or a student do it, and you're going to know what's the best um, what's the best way for your students based on your learning environment. The nice part too is is that because you start out with roles on a daily basis, even in a face to face environment 
you have that chat monitor, timekeeper, note taker, they then become very comfortable with roles. And when you start adding in other roles, like an illustrator or a spokesperson, it's expected. And so they'll, they'll lean into those opportunities. And so now's the fun part, right? Um, do you all ever get the tingles when something happens instructionally and you feel full engagement in your classroom? Can I just get a reaction if you know, maybe you, you might not be as intuitive as I am. I've recently learned that I'm super intuitive, but I know what it feels like when the instructional um, tasks that I am using to engage in learning work with my students. And it's like, I call it like teacher soul food for me. It's one of the most wonderful elements of my job. And oftentimes that happens the most for me is in formative assessment that is um, engages my students in their own reflection of learning. And what it does is it also allows me to give formative assessment while they're giving formative assessment to themselves and each other. And so one of the ways that I have done this is I've done this through the rubric developed feedback cycle. And so you'll notice that in the first task on my sample interactive agenda, I have feedback cycles with names of students. They've added these names here. And so they've gone in and added their names and it's just in three columns. So it's easy to read. And we're, the intent of this is after the group has led us through the assignment, which is the once you know it, show it simulation. This is for a group of pre-service teachers um, who are doing their early field experience. So they're not quite ready for student teaching. Um, at that point, at the end, students are going to go ahead and do um, a peer review using the actual rubric, which is linked here in the chat. And so the way that we do that is we would open up the rubric Someone would take turns being the uh, facilitator. So I will model it for them first and then ask for a student facilitator. And this is the rubric that students use to develop their once you know it, show it simulation. And I've broken it up into multiple sections. Um, to spur debrief, I've asked some very specific questions that my students can use as almost sentence starters. But the nice thing is that about it too is it's a place where my students know, hey, these are the things we're gonna talk about during our debrief. And they're gonna earn points for if they um, created their simulation with these debrief skills in mind. It really helps them feel like they're able to prepare for the learning. And so, Going back to our example, I might ask whoever the first person is on the list, start with a question and we go down the list. It's great because students know when their time is going to be up to provide feedback. Um, and they're also um, writing down feedback for each other. So it's a full engagement strategy. Students get to pick which questions they ask. That's the power of it as well, because they don't have to ask it in, this, in a linear model. They ask the question that they feel is an important question for that particular group. And so this also encourages full engagement because we have to pay attention, right? You can't go through like we used to when we did paragraph reads and you were like, oh, I'm number 10. I'm, I've got the next, I need to make sure I'm ready to read the 10th paragraph in the, art, in the article. No, you've got to make sure that you're not asking a question that somebody has already asked. Once we've gotten through some of the debrief questions, I then typically open it up and allow people to ask questions in the actual criteria. And so the nice thing is, is this is a single criteria rubric where proficiency demonstrates full points and students can give feedback to each other where the group might have exceeded the criteria and gone beyond or where they're not quite meeting the criteria yet and provide feedback. 
we connected these to our TPEs and high leverage practices because we're preparing for student teaching and this is the final that goes along with the early field experience. Notice how it's a question in the debrief, something like audience appropriateness. Um, the reason why that is, is because they need to really plan for audience appropriateness and then we also need to debrief it. Hopefully what you're seeing here is an opportunity to bridge those best practices to facilitate. Students are then facilitating using a rubric and then of course going in and providing feedback to each other using the same rubric and the interactive agenda provides a flow. So that's a lot right there and I just wanna pause and see if there are any questions. Okay. Um, I, I do the first time. I actually use the same feedback cycle multiple times. I do it during the midterm and the final so that they feel comfortable doing it. And I do provide points for full engagement for being part of the feedback. I don't like that passive sitting there and not answering um, feedback. I find that to be, um, I find that to not be supportive for a collaborative learning space. And so I build that into the expectation and into my grades for each of the uh, midterm and final, that they're not just there to listen to simulations, that they have to provide explicit feedback. So um, they did ask us to end um, as close to the noon time, central time as possible. And so um, I want to make sure that we have some minutes to debrief in um, appropriate um, uh, intentional learning strategies. So I'm gonna post this debrief also in the chat and I'm gonna ask everyone to share how they might use the interactive agenda with their learners to encourage ownership of learning. And again, you can even extend it beyond the synchronous classroom and into the face-to-face -face classroom. And then we'll pause for some questions. I think your agenda is perfect and I will follow your agenda as I don't have like a lot of experience teaching, but I'm getting prepared. So this will yeah. be helping me a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And as you get ready and you present, it's a great way to have a structure and a strategy. Um, when you build that structure and strategy into your learning environment, it makes space for you to do the formative assessment to make sure that you're picking the intentional strategies, et cetera. It also goes into that learning environment piece, which is TPE one and two, which you'll learn about. Correct, thank you. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah, that's a great way, Ashley. Yep, you can pop that link right in there and you're ready to go. I have a page in my canvas for the interactive agendas and I use them um, religiously um, where every class has an interactive agenda, no matter if it's face-to-face -face or um, interactive. What I have gotten a lot less of is what did we learn today or what did I miss? Because the first couple of times I get that comment, I say, oh my gosh, we really missed you please go into the interactive agenda. You can access the recording. You can see samples of student work. If we did some sort of process learning, the learning objective is there, the reminders of due dates. And it's not to replace the facilitation, it's to bolster. Um, we know that uh, best practices 
learning should always come first and technology is always there to support the learning. And so this is one way that you can use to support learning, differentiate learning and communicate that with your learners and have them communicate with you. I've popped QR codes in here, everything. It's, it's, it's really what I used to replace the slide deck that was very passive. Now I know we're using slides here as adult learners. This is more of a presentation, but I like to think of learning as something that you're facilitating. And so the interactive agenda allows me to do that. Yeah, I'm glad Vanessa. Yeah, it really is. It's a great way to encourage them and give them the roles. Maybe they get to be the person that creates it. You know, really the sky's the limit. All right. So I have time for questions and I just wanna be here to provide any suggestions um, or responses that you might have. Um, and I very much appreciate your time um, and your support. I'll pop my email into the chat um, and I look forward to connecting um, with any of you if you have more questions. I would like to say thank you, but also <clears throat> I have a question. Do you guys offer, offer like a workshop or something to you know, to learn more, like um, anything that you guys have, any sessions online? Um, so as far as our credential program or just in general as professional development offered by the university? Um, yes, as um, in general. So um, they reached out, I was, Teach LA reached out to me and asked me to present. And so I'm presenting here. Um, we do sometimes offer things on our website. You can certainly check that out. Um, and then we have a multitude of credential and master's programs as well that we offer at San Diego State. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Ashley and Cheryl. I appreciate you all very much. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Leticia. I know it's about to be lunchtime. You probably are ready to head out. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Likewise. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Same to you. Bye-bye. Any questions? I'm happy to answer.